Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Will Hoyt, and the title of my talk is Declarative Deep Learning and Closure. Um, we've had amazing deep learning talks so far this conj, and uh, I really hope that mine kind of contributes to your understanding of the topic matter and um, really is enlightening. Um, so to start, uh, you know, this is me, I'm kind of a nerd. Um, yeah, I studied neuroscience in school. I now do uh, data science and other sciency and data things at work. Um, and obviously my tool of choice is closure. Um, it makes my days go by really quickly. Uh, you know, I have three points in my day, right? When I wake up, when I have lunch, and when I go home. The rest of my time is just spent uh, in the world of closure having a great time solving problems. Um, and I get to solve those problems in an amazing company uh, called Yet Analytics. Uh, we're located here uh, in Baltimore, about mm, five to seven blocks away. Uh, and in this picture, you might recognize Milt Reeder, um, who gave an amazing talk yesterday about how Datomic and the, th uh, the thoughts contained within Datomic really changed the way we think about problems and how we solve them. Um, so, we're gonna step into the matrix because when we're talking about deep learning, there's no escaping matrices, right? Um, they are essentially where the learning happens and how the learning happens. Uh, it's all matrix multiplication, linear algebra, all of those fun things. Um, and so the question is then, uh, how, do we, how do we manipulate these matrices in order to induce learning? Um, and all it comes down to is an optimization problem, right? Uh, we have some error, which is a measure of what our network tells us is the answer and what we know the answer is. And we can kind of think of that as creating this um, three-dimensional error space, which we see um, in the graph on the top. And so all the optimization algorithms do is they go from the red peaks of error space and they try and climb down that hill and find the blue valleys. Um, and so that happens through um, optimization, uh, like I've said, and linear algebra. Um, and that's not really that interesting, to be honest, right? Um, it's an iterative process where we're just trying to climb down a hill and make sure our, net, our next step um, is not in the wrong direction. Um, so let's get to a, more, a topic I find more interesting, which is you know, how does our brain actually learn and how do we learn? Um, and in order to kind of get an understanding or the a necessary context, let's start with uh, neurons, the building blocks of the brain. So we can see here that we've got um, two neurons, one on the left and one on the right, that are talking to each other. Um, the one on the left is known as the presynaptic cell, whereas the one on the right is known as the postsynaptic cell. The presynaptic cell sends an electrical message through uh, an axon, which you can see right here, uh, to its neighbor, and that is how they communicate. Um, and in order to get into a little bit more detail, what actually happens is as that signal passes from like here in the cell body all the way to the end of the axon, it'll actually stimulate the end of the cell um, and cause the cell membrane to change and to release these chemicals called neurotransmitters. Um, neurotransmitters come in various uh, shapes and sizes, have various effects, um, and that's a rabbit hole I could go down, but I'm not, I'm not going to. Um, the only thing that you need to know is that uh, these neurotransmitters travel across that little gap of space from the presynaptic cell to the postsynaptic cell, where they then bind to dendrites on the postsynaptic and cause a form of reaction. Uh, so what happens is as those uh, neurotransmitters bind, we see this effect where it changes the membrane potential of the postsynaptic cell. And once that membrane potential gets uh, to a certain threshold, we see this massive increase in membrane potential, which is just that electrical signal, uh, the action potential, or the form of communication between these cells. Um, after the action potential fires off, there's a restabilization period in which the membrane potential drops down before its resting level and enters this period called the refractory period. Um, this is important because during this time, no other action potentials can be generated, and this kind of sets up the mechanics of um, how communication actually happens. And so 
thinking of just two cells, like you can't really do much with that. There's not much that can be extracted from that. Um, but when you network these things all together with n different connections, right, you now have a very chaotic system where emergent behavior starts to come out of it, where that emergent behavior, you know, is us, right? That's our thoughts, those are our memories, those are, you know, our perceptions of the world. And um, then the question becomes, well, how do um, these neuron interactions, how do they actually lead to learning? Um, and this is a problem we've been tackling for the last 60 or so years, and we still don't have it fully right, um, but we do have a decent understanding of kind of the underlying mechanics. Um, and there's two forms. There's associative learning and there's non-associative learning. Um, associative learning was first kind of um, proven in 1949 um, by this guy, Donald Webb, and uh, he basically set up and theorized and led to uh, the experiments known as classical conditioning. Um, so during classical conditioning, two cells or two stimuli are um, paired together uh, and they're paired to a certain reward. So um, an experiment that is referenced a lot is classical conditioning in which a dog was trained to salivate at the sound of a bell because the experimenter um, rang a bell every time it was feeding time. And so kind of the classic um, way that this is usually described is cells that fire together wire together um, because when they fire together, there's an actual change at the dendrites here where more are added. So that way um, this interaction has a more pronounced effect. And to give uh, some more perspective on this, we are going to go and watch Jim and Dwight uh, actually kind of demonstrate this. Unless there's no volume. Okay, well, unfortunately I didn't get the audio working properly, but Jim trains Dwight to uh, expect an Altoid every time he restarts his computer. So at the very end, what ends up happening is um, Jim, you know, restarts his computer and Dwight just reaches out his hand and Jim's like, well, you know, what are you doing? And he goes, uh, uh, my mouth feels weird. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> and, you know, there's the classic Jim smirk. Um, but so that was associative learning. Um, but then I said there was two types of learning, right? Um, there's also non-associative. And this was kind of proven in a very, very simple model. Uh, it's the sea slug. It's got a scientific name that I can't pronounce. You're not going to care about. So we're just going to call it the sea slug because that's just what we know it by. Um, but essentially uh, what matters is it has this gill which is how it breathes, right? And whenever you touch this part of the animal, there will be a reaction in which the gill contracts. Um, and so this only led to um, the discovery of habituation, which is where repeated, uh, a single stimuli, when it's repeatedly presented, the effect of it will actually get diminished over time. So you can see here in the top that, you know, we, we touch it, there are some action potentials that get fired off, there's a response by the neuron that actually controls the muscle, and we, we see a gill retraction. Um, and then after habituation, so after repeated you know, touching of that uh, part of the animal, the siphon, uh, we actually see a decreased response of the motor neuron, and then no retraction actually happens. Um, and so that's one form of non-associative learning, habituation. There's another form of uh, habitu or, excuse me, of non-associative learning, and this is called sensitization. Uh, the way that this was shown um, or experimented on or experimented with to prove the existence of, um, the experiment consisted of the, ex the experimenter applying a uh, sh electrical shock to the tail of the animal. Um, so what we see at first is a little bit more pronounced of a reaction uh, just because, you know, the animal's getting shocked, right? Like that's gonna um, trigger that same mechanism. But after repeated shocks, what actually happens is, you know, nothing about the shock state or uh, change, it was the same shock every time. Um, but after being presented with that shock enough times, 
there is actually an enhancement in the response that um, we see and can measure. And so the interesting thing is these properties can be combined and can work together. So we see uh, from trial 1 to 13, you know, as we touch the siphon, the actual magnitude of the gill contraction or that response goes down. But then at trial 14, the shock of the tail and the touch of the siphon get paired, and we see almost a exact response than when we saw during trial 1. Um, and so what this does is this really kind of highlights the basis for how our, um, how our memory works. So associative plus non-associative learning allows our brains to create a uh, stable representation of the world. So that way we can have expectations, we can predict what might be coming next, um, and we can react to things that don't meet our expectations. Um, and so this is what allows humans to continuously learn throughout life without uh, the cost of losing information. Just because we learn a new fact does not mean that we forget an old one. Um, and that's known as the stability uh, plasticity dilemma. And it, it, it's amazing, right? Because uh, as we'll see in future slides, that's not always the case in other um, learning models. Um, but to kind of prove my point about attention and stable models, um, the last slide, this one, did that catch anyone's attention? Um, was anyone expecting that? Uh, you probably weren't, and that's why it kind of like grabbed you at least for a second, right? Um, and that, that is what's so powerful about how we learn and how we can focus on some information and leave some other information out. And in the mid-60s uh, to late 60s, there was a model of memory that was developed, which basically captures that, right? So we have sensory information coming in. Uh, we attend to the parts of it that are novel or that are worth paying attention to. And that gets stored in short-term memory, which is also known as working memory. It's um, what you experience uh, in, in the now, right? And the information that we're storing there can be uh, converted into long-term memory for long-term storage via rehearsal or you know, repeated um, exposure to it. Um, and that long-term memory is then queried for and used when we're trying to think about things or remember them. Uh, and it's also used to identify and do pattern recognition on incoming stimulus so that way we can um, have we can recognize things that come in and use our previous knowledge to determine how we react to them, right? So that way we can continuously learn and build upon what we have already learned. Um, or thinking about this in another way, we have the part that works when you're at your desk and a part that's happening when you're in the hammock. Um, so this kind of uh, brings me back to uh, traditional feed-forward neural networks um, because feed forward neural networks suffer from massive forgetting. They, uh, once they're trained on something, they can be great at doing that one thing, but you cannot train it to then do something else without it forgetting what it already knew. So I can't train this model to identify cats and then say, okay, well now analyze this time series. Uh, it just, it's one or the other. And that's a limitation, but that's fine, right? Like these models are still amazing, can still do amazing things. The, you just need to be aware of the limitations when you're using them. Um, but not all models suffer from this problem. Um, back in the 70s and since then, there has been uh, this model called the Adaptive Resonance Theory model, which was uh, created by these two people, um, Stephen Grossberg and Gail Carpenter, out of the University of Boston. And it tries to mimic the way that our our memory actually works. And so in brief, what happens is we have information that gets encoded here, and that's like our typical input um, at this F1 layer. It then gets compared to categories the model has already learned in the F2 layer. And if there's a matching, uh, we enter into what's known as a resonance state, which means everything's good. Um, there's nothing that we really need to pay attention to here, right? We already know it. Um, we can obviously refine our understanding of it, but that's kind of, um, that's the use of that. Um, but where it gets interesting 
is when there's a mismatch, right? Because this system can then stimulate the F2 layer in order to look for a new category to match against, or if none of the categories actually match, to create a whole new category that represents this incoming data. Um, and so this is what kind of gets around that massive forgetting problem, um, which, is, which is really cool because now you can have an adaptive system um, that knows how to respond given its context. And you can control the level or how fine grain the categories stored in F2 are via um, various hyperparameters. Um, but at the end of the day, what it is, is it's bottom up and top down interactions being compared. So as we saw, it's F1 to F2 and F2 back to F1. And you can think of that in human memory as what we already know versus what's being presented to us, right? Do we expect it or do we need to actually pay attention to this and is this novel information? Um, unfortunately, these have not gotten uh, there, this type of model has not gotten all the hype that I think it deserves. Uh, it has been successfully uh, applied across various engineering domains, but its main application has been within um, neural and cognitive modeling and actually creating models of um, n real neuron interactions and whatnot. Um, but there are some other types of networks that kind of have this memory property, um, but are buzzword compliant and have been very successful. And those are the long short-term memory recurrent neural network models, or LSTM for short. They were generated by these four gentlemen up here. And in order to kind of explain it, I'm going to um, lean on Chris Ola and his amazing blog describing how these systems actually work. Um, and it's understanding LSTMs. You can find it on his Twitter page or you can just Google it. It's usually the first thing that comes up. Um, and so what we're seeing here, right, is that the, the output of one of these cells, or these cells labeled A, right, is getting looped back through into itself. And then we can unravel that loop to have it look something like this, where we're moving throughout time. Um, but let's actually get into how these things kind of work. So the first thing we need to know about is the self state. The cell state is just the flow of information that describes what the current state of the world is. Um, so the, we need to manipulate that cell state. And the first thing that happens during that manipulation process is the forget gate, which basically takes in the input and what was previously known and says, okay, given this new information, what, is in, what do I need to forget, right? What do I not need to remember anymore? And, you know, there, there's some, some black, box lo that, excuse me, black box logic that happens there that we're not really gonna get into. Um, the next step is we need to figure out, given this uh, new input, what are our relevant features, right? What do we need to pay attention to and how much of it do we need to pay attention to? The final step is actually determining what the cell is going to output. Um, so given our new cell state, which got manipulated uh, via the forget gate and the feature extraction gets passed through and we now figure out, okay, we have our cell state. How much of this are we going to pass through to the next iteration of the loop? Um, and so at a kind of high level, the way LSTMs process information is they decide, well, what am I going to forget? What new information do I care about? and what part of our updated cell state do we want to pass on? Uh, whereas in human memory, the way we uh, think about things and the way we learn is what about my environment should I pay attention to? Is that information worth remembering? And then if it is, I'm gonna store it so I can identify it again. And I really want to highlight point two, is that information worth remembering? Because you know, there's a lot of information that we get bombarded with every day, right? Some of it just we ignore, some of it is just not worth our time. And uh, speaking of things that are not worth our time, I would like to talk to you about the Java Builder pattern. Um, <laughs> so as we saw, if you were at the Recurrent Neural Network talk yesterday, we saw how ugly these can be and how um, annoying they are to work with. Um, and before we dive too much into the Java Builder pattern, I want to take a step back and talk about uh, constructors. 
Um, they're a part of Java. We have to deal with them. And in order to use a library like DL4J, we have to be ready to work with them. Um, now, Java interop is never really fun. And I would recommend going with a library like Cortex if it solves the issues you're trying to solve. Um, but if it does not have the tools to do so, um, and if you need, like in particular, if you need recurrent neural networks or LSTMs to get the job done, that's when I would reach out into the Java ecosystem and kind of find yourself in this DL4J interop land. Um, but getting back to constructors. Um, so they use the position, the number, and the type of arguments that they get passed in order to try and understand our intention and then to you know, perform some function. And if, the, if there was only like one set of these, um, like if there was only a single arity, right, or not arity is the wrong word, but if there's only a single set of conditions that a constructor dispatched off of, that would be fine, right? We could, we could deal with that. Um, but that's not the case, right? There's n different arities where the, everything, every little thing matters. Um, and if you mess up any little part of that, you're not going to get the result you expect. Um, so really what we want to do is we want to tell, we want to declare what our arguments are and have the constructor understand what that means, right? Without any additional worrying on our part. Um, so if we look on the right, could you tell me which one of those integers correlates to the batch size? I mean, probably not, right? There's no indication. Um, and at the end of the day, does it really matter which one it does? Like at the end of the day, we just want to tell it, okay, this is the batch size, right? Or my labels are located here. I don't want to have to worry about, well, the label comes before the batch size and so on and so forth. Um, and so the builder pattern was kind of developed to combat this, right? We wanted to make it more declarative um, and have an easier, more readable way of working with these constructors with crazy amounts of configuration. Um, and this is a step in the right direction, right? It's more declarative. We can kind of tell what's going on, right? Like a seed is getting set here. We're setting a learning rate. We're adding some layers. Um, but we still have to deal with a lot of issues here, right? We now need to know all the different ways that these builders can be configured. We need to ensure that when we're calling these methods that we're calling them in the correct order. Uh, for example, if I was to call these layers before I called list, it would break. Um, and the only way you can know that is through playing with this stuff, right? And going through the hassle of setting it all up just to learn that something's broken down chain. Um, so, the way I handle this is I just have, I handle all that logic for you behind the scenes and I allow just keyword args to be passed so that way um, you can just tell the machine what you want in your model and it figures out the rest for you. Um, you should still be aware of what your options are and how you can use them, but you don't need to worry about, um, in my mind, unimportant things like ordering and whatnot. Um, and, you know, this is all well and great, right? Um, I've got declarative arguments. They, they do something behind the scene, and they're supposed to evaluate to some Java object, right? But how do I know that I didn't, how do you know that I didn't mess up my mapping, right? How do you know that what's actually going on behind the scenes is right? Um, and typically, you would, you know, look to the tests, right? But when we're testing in Java interop land, I mean, it's typically we just make sure the return type is correct, right? Because we don't really have much, much control outside of that, right? Like we can go through testing getters and setters, but when we're working with constructors and builders, if we want to make sure that it's properly configured, we're kind of limited in that. Um, and I saw that as a huge issue, right? Especially when you're working as some, with something as complex as deep learning. Uh, I want to know that when I pass my, my arguments and I set up my configuration, that everything is as I expect it, right? I don't want to get, um, I don't want to shoot myself in the foot and only realize it 10 to 15 steps later and then have to comb through everything I've done in order to figure out what went wrong. Um, so my solution to this was, I said, you know what? Behind the scenes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have any function that creates a constructor or a builder actually just output a data structure that is my Java interop. 
I now have pure functions which create closure data structures that I can now test against and be sure that when I pass these set of, um, of arguments, I know that this is coming out. And I can test against this, right? So if I'm going through refactoring or if I'm uh, doing any other changes to the code base and my tests start failing, I know that it failed for a reason, right? Because you can think of if it wasn't done this way and we're just checking on the return type, given how many different configurations these things could have, even if a typo found its way in there, your test wouldn't really kind of show that. Um, and so I think this is, this is a really powerful idea. Um, and I've ported a lot of functionality over from DL4J and made it work in this way. Uh, not everything is there, but kind of the core of what that library is, it is um, ported over. So we have um, data set imports. Um, there's no real data manipulation stuff because obviously we would just use closure for that. Um, we have the neural network DSL, which is you know all the predefined layers that uh, DL4J defines for us. We can train our networks using standard backpropagation training. Um, and then we also have access to this thing called early stopping training, where we can actually control uh, at what point and under what conditions we exit training and can then tinker with our model again. Uh, we can also do training within a cluster uh, using Spark. And we have network evaluation, so we can actually figure out how well our model is doing. Um, now time for the dreaded uh, live demo. Um, so what we have here is just uh, a REPL. And how easy is that to see? Yeah. So. How's that? Cool. All right. So we're going to bring in some namespaces. And first thing we're going to do is just kind of look at some general data import. Um, so I've got a CSV located in my resources file. Um, and unfortunately, this is very Java-esque. And I was very explicit in all the steps here just to kind of illustrate um, you know, that this is, this is still being kind of true to the Java nature of it, but handling it in a closure way. Um, so we set up this thing called the file split, which actually looks at the file itself. We then have a record reader, um, and then we have an iterator, right? If we were to actually look at this, um, and we'll do that in a second, um, we'll see that it's all just kind of, it's a Java interop data structure behind the scenes. So we're going to normalize, and now we're actually going to look at some data. So there, I've got an input and an output. That's in a form that's ready to be passed to a neural network, and we're good to go. Um, now let's look at the classical hello world example of deep learning, or um, training on the minced um, handwritten digit set. So we're going to set up our configuration. And I mean, there's a bunch of stuff that kind of goes into this. So it is um, a little scary in that way. But once you learn, and if you have an understanding of what these various parameters are actually doing, uh, it makes sense as to why you would want all of them, right? Because again, we're doing something that's very complex and needs this level of hyperparameters. So I'm going to set up my uh, actual data there. Um, and we're actually going to train this using early stopping. And so in early stopping, I'm right now setting up the conditions under which I'm going to stop. And so this one's saying, you know, if my network somehow produces an invalid store, uh, score, we're going to stop it. Um, and we're only going to let it run for two uh, epochs. So here is uh, what it looks like altogether. And warning, this is, you know, because all of these things are put together, this is a pretty crazy data structure, right? We have um, our actual, like, whole thing there. But let's kind of look at some of these parts, right? So we've got our data set. So these are all setting up various properties of the early stopping. Um, and then here, we can actually see our network configuration. Uh, we've got our layer calls. We've got uh, the setting up of various um, 
hyperparameters and whatnot. And if I was to evaluate this list, uh, I would get back my, um, my Java object, which represents this configuration. Um, we're not going to go through training because that would take up a little bit too much of your time. So I'm just going to load in a model, and we're going to evaluate it and see what we get out. Um, so we set up an evaluator, and now we're going to look at how well this model was able to classify handwritten digits. And so we see an accuracy of 0.98. So you know that's, that's pretty good. Uh, but what was, how did it actually do? And we can see that um, how it actually labeled different things that it was presented with, right? So it got zero correct 968 times. It got one correct, um, or the label one correct uh, 1126 times, and so on and so forth. And you can see, like, it, it still messes up sometimes, right? These things are not perfect. Um, and we typically don't want them to be perfect. We want them to be generalized and have good recognition without just memorizing the data set on which they were trained on. Um, and we can see kind of a, an outline of the various scores down here at the bottom. So now we're gonna kind of look through a LSTM example. And so we're gonna set up, I've got, again, data located at various places. Um, and we're going to go through the same basic process, right? We're going to set up our input splits. Uh, we are going to, and we obviously have test sets and um, training sets. We're going to set up our record readers for both the training and the test. And then we're going to create our iterators, right? It's a, it's a very Java-y process. And it can be, you know, these steps can be combined into one, right? Um, but I wanted to be, like I said, I wanted to be very explicit here. Um, here we're actually going to normalize our data to be within a range that the neural network can actually expect um, and work with. And so now all of our data is ready to go and ready to be fed to a model. Um, and now we initialize our model. And let's actually look at what it looks like. Um, so again, it's just a data structure, right? We're saying, OK. We've got this class, multi-layered network. It's made out of this neural network configuration builder, which has these methods called on it. Um, and, and specifically, the layers, um, we can see that also the Graves LSTM are uh, builders. And you know the layers are builders, the models are builders, everything's a builder. Um, so I know that what's going on behind the scenes is what I expect. And then, again, I'm just going to pull in a trained model um, and create an evaluation guy for it um, and then figure out how well it did by running it against the test set. And so we can see that this one didn't do as well as our previous example, um, but it did a pretty good job. And we see uh, like about 95% accuracy where um, we see the exact same information we saw before. And so I find this way of working with uh, DL4J much more enjoyable and much more manageable. Um, and so there's still some things that are left to do, right? Um, besides just the basic uh, neural network DSL, there's also computational graphs, which allow you to configure things in your own way. Um, there's reinforcement learning. Uh, there's a front end for actually visualizing what's happening during this training. There's Kafka support. There's CUDA support. And of course, I want to add in specs. Um, so there's still a lot left on my plate um, and a lot left to do. But as it stands right now, as you saw, we can, we can get data in, we can train a model on it, and we can evaluate uh, how well that model performs. Um, so this talk was given um, in a memorial to uh, Jason Lewis. Uh, he was uh, my mentor and the only reason that I'm in closure at all. Um, he recently passed away, and I remember, you know, year like about a year and a half ago, we were sitting down watching closure conj talks. This was my, uh, you know, my first few months in closure, and he goes, "Hey, you know, maybe one day you'll be up there." Um, and now, look where I am. So I hope I've made him proud, and I hope that, uh, you know. He's in a better place. So thank you. Uh, that was my talk, and any questions are welcome.
Yes. I'm sorry, I, I can't actually hear you. Um, so reinforcement learning is typically used, um, you see it in AI that learn to play games, right? Because they essentially play the game against themselves until they learn the optimal strategy. Um, so in regards to applications, um, that kind of spans a lot of different domains, right? This is more like when you actually want an adaptive AI that lives in some kind of environment, right? That's where you would combine things like reinforcement learning and um, layer types and model types that actually have um, adaptive memory. Um, so ART, the model that I showed you, the limitation of that is only on binary classification. Um, I really find that there um, is not as many limitations because we don't suffer from that massive forgetting problem. And there's also a lot more application within, again, adaptive AI. It's just that um, it hasn't been used, that model architecture has not been used to go and win a bunch of different deep learning modeling competitions. So it hasn't really gained the hype that uh, a model like LSTM has. Um, and I think both could be used to, or variants of art could be used to uh, achieve the same results as LSTMs. It just hasn't been a major focus within the community. Um, so I think, I didn't fully hear the question, but I, I know that uh, when it comes to doing training in a distributed manner, that's what we kind of use Spark for, and we can offload that, that process to a cluster which handles that for us. Um, but it, the amazing thing is, is those models that I showed you, I trained both of those within 40 minutes, right? Just using my laptop, which has no GPUs, there's no CUDA support, nothing like that. Um, so the actual training speed at which these things happen is not uh, nearly as bad as it used to be, uh, given the optimizations at the JVM level uh, that DL4J has implemented. Um, any other questions? All right, thank you.